So have you ever wondered how democracy got started in the world, the history of democracy, and how it evolved into what America has today? Well, I talk with my guest right now. His name is Richard Lyons. He's author of the new book, The DNA of Democracy. And we're going to discuss not only the history of democracy, but how we can protect its future, especially in the United States of America. So, Richard, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me, Michael. So before we get started, I wanted to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. Um, what is your background and why did you decide to write this book? Um, I, I have had a long history of uh, education, self, self-made self education, and have written other works. And the idea of democracy's fragility led me to write a book about democracy so that persons know uh, what gives it strength or weakness, how it was founded, and how it needs to be protected. And you talked and you said there, democracy's fragility. Um, what, what made you think of that now? Do you feel like um, democracy is at stake in re- because of recent events or anything? Is there something that you've seen recently in our political culture that has made you worry about the future of it? I, I just think that in the past 50 years, uh, the democracy we enjoy has gone a bit from its foundations to concentrating itself in the federal government and in one city. And I think that's contrary to the manner in which the country was founded. Yeah, expound on that a little bit. What do you mean by that? <clears throat> when the country was founded, it was founded on the uh, basis of the individual and uh, the individual's rights and associations and individual representation, firstly in a local government, then in a state government, then in a federal government. And that has somewhat flipped. Uh, Whereas powers were secured to the individual and states formerly and localities, they are now being taken to the federal level in a lot of instances. Such as when you have an EPA that determines that all water in America is uh, the property of the federal government and can be regulated like that. Yeah, so you feel like um, just looking at the bureaucratic state, for instance, you have the EPA, you have other bureaucracies, straight out of Washington, D.C., you feel like that is an example of going away from what America was founded on in individual rights and liberty? Yes, uh, whereas formerly law, all law, was generated through the individual, through his representatives or her representatives, In in an assembly, nowadays there are bureaucracies wholly unelected by the people who determine most of the law that we see today. So you look at what's going on today, you look at all of that and how it's against America's founding, and then you decide to write this book, The DNA of Democracy. Talk a little bit about your thought process on starting this book, where you started from, and then we'll go from there. Well, I noticed, uh, Michael, how, how rare democracy is, so I pinpointed those places where it has existed and went to a study of how those democracies were created. Mostly they were rebellions against an extreme tyranny. And then what elements existed in those democracies? So when you look at Athens, you look at its constitution, and you look at the free arts and expression that it enjoyed. When you look at Rome, you look at its representative government, and the 12 tables of law that were created. When you go to Britain, you look at the Magna Carta and its idea of individual rights and rights of property. And all those things added together came together uniquely in America, along with the uh, Amerindian example of uh, the idea of federation. And all those elements together created our Constitution. So it's a very, very unique uh, ideational organon on which our country was founded, and it was based fundamentally on the individual. And when you go back and you uh, read about and you studied ancient democracies about, like, what happened in Greece and then Rome, like you said, Representative Magna Carta, um, a lot of those ended up failing in the long run, ended up not succeeding for the long run, and then going towards tyranny. Why do you think that is? I think wherever there, wherever power exists, it tends to concentration, 
And where it concentrates, it defends itself. And as it defends itself, it destroys individual rights. Uh, and I, you can see that a little bit nowadays here, and it worries me a, a bit. All right, I'm speaking with Richard Lyons on his new book, The DNA of Democracy. Richard, do you have a website if people want to find out more about you? Uh, yes, it's uh, spelled L-Y-L-E-A dot com, pronounced Lilia dot com. All right. So when you look at uh, democracy and the history of democracy, I, I actually I believe you start your book. You know, a lot of people think when it, of democracy starting, they think of Greece, like you mentioned, or Athens. And but you actually start in Israel. How is Israel? How did that become the starting point uh, when you were looking at the evolution of democracy? It's a it's a fundamental uh, <clears throat> opposition between the Egyptians concept of the Pharaoh holding all power to the concept of the Ten Commandments or law governing uh, a people. And so the expression, uh, of the first expression of democratic government actually came from a demonstration of a people being ruled first by law, not by a Pharaoh or a king. So that, that was fundamental to where we are today uh, as being a people who lives by the law and nobody being above that law. Even the kings of Israel were subject to the law. So it's a fundamental difference. And, and that, I thought, was the, the birthplace. So the birthplace, you know, it's not necessarily the idea of one man, one vote, but the birthplace is the idea that we're all governed by laws, not governed necessarily by men or by all powerful men or women, for that matter. Correct. Or, well, when you get, we are governed by persons who are our representatives, yes? But we are not governed by one person who is above the law and can exercise any, any whim against persons who uh, have rights. All right, so the, you go from Israel, and then what, what hap, what's the next step after Israel when you're looking at the, the history of democracy? Well, from there, the next, the next origination of democracy... Uh, was in Greece, and that came in answer to a tyranny by uh, a tyrant called Isagoras, who determined when he came into power that half of Athens was cursed and half was not. Those were, who were cursed were, of course, not his friends, and they were to be dispossessed of property, dispossessed of citizenship, and exiled from Athens. Uh, and that's what created a, a rebellion against Isagoras, and his uh, mercenary army of, of uh, Spartans. And so the pe it was the first instance of a people taking over their own government uh, and throwing the tyrant out. And this finds recurrence in uh, Rome, in the case of uh, the Tarquins, when they were thrown out of power, and it occurred again uh, when they threw King John out of power in England. So there's always, in history, there's an expression of ultimate tyranny, and then a rebellion against that tyranny and a foundation of of law. Yeah, and a lot of times, like you said, it's a overthrowing of tyranny and a foundation of law. But how exactly does that lead to what we understand of as democracy, where the people are actually voting for representatives or in sometimes actually voting on each individual law? Uh well, that it is the fundamental fundamental idea that the people determined who would, the people determined who would rule them, and in assemblies, those persons who who represent the people create law, and the people are ruled by law rather than a person. Now, do you think uh, the difference between that yeah. and a and a tyrant having an army and ruling through that or ministers? Now, do you think in order for a democracy to succeed, you know, you talked about. Israel and how they had the Ten Commandments and that fundamentally set up a foundation of law. And do you think for a democracy to succeed, they need something beyond just the people's will that they need a foundational belief in God or a belief in some kind of religion or something in that order for a democracy to succeed for the long term? I, I think that there are necessary elements uh, that are constitutional to a democracy, and one is the uh, Constitution itself, which determines what bodies have powers, how those powers are uh, come of the people, 
and how the people are protected from any exaggeration in those powers. Um, I think uh, a faith system, a spiritual system, is, is fundament, fundamental to the idea of individual worth and from the idea of individual worth where we are all equally worthy. We are all equally worthy of having rights. We're all equally worthy of exercising power. When you get away from the idea of individual worth, you get away from the idea of individuals having a right to their own power, a right to their own individuality. So I think, yes, uh, a a spiritual foundation is important to that idea. Because you have to have a spiritual foundation to have some kind of individual worth, because a lot of times if you don't, you're saying, um, you know, that belief can go away. Maybe, maybe you don't care about the individual because you want to support the collective more or something like that? Yeah, I, I, the, first, the first thing uh, of any uh, socialist or communist state, the first, their, the first exercise of their power is always against the spiritual parallel authority. And you find that first, uh, well, you find it eternally, but you find it recently in the establishment of the Soviet Union when the first object of uh, the Bolsheviks' wrath was the church in Russia. The first thing they did was get rid of the church and demanded that nobody, you know, have a spiritual foundation so that they would first serve the state. And so the state becomes God, and whoever is the tyrant at the head of that state becomes a god. Yeah, it's kind of interesting when when you think about tyrants of the past, even going all the way back to ancient Egypt, that is what they did, isn't it? Isn't, you know, they usually, the pharaoh would say, not only was he was the leader, but he was God, and that's how he was able to con- get absolute power for himself in a way. Yes, it, it, I, I treat of that in the very first part of you. You had talked about the foundation in Israel of law, and I juxtapose that to the pharaoh and his unassailable nature and his, his standing above everyone, and that reputation is what... Uh, held him in power and held the multitudes in slavery. I am speaking with Richard Lyons. He's author of the new book, The DNA of Democracy. So far, we've been talking about the evolution of democracy in history, how it got started. But we also need to talk about where democracy is today and maybe some misconceptions about uh, democracy, not only here in the United States but around the world. So you want to stay put for more of this conversation. Richard Lyons, who is the author of the new book, The DNA of Democracy. We've been discussing the history of democracy, how it originated in the world, and how it evolved into what is known in our country today, in our republic, the United States of America. And we're going to talk more about that in a second. And Richard, I just wanted to say once again, thank you so much for coming on the show. And uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity to let people know how they can find your book and how they can find more information on you. Well, it's available through all the normal channels, through Amazon or your uh, local bookstore if you wanted to order it. Uh, It's also available in audio through ACX and uh, Amazon Audible, and its uh, it's audible form is also uh, available through Apple and iTunes. So, now, any information on me, you would find at my website at lilia.com. It's spelled L-Y-L-E-A.com. All right. And so I understand that when, you, when you're going over this book and when one thing that motivated you to write this book is you're pretty passionate, it seems, about American democracy and wanting to protect our democracy today. How is American democracy different than other democracies in history what 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 are its foundations and how is it different than what we've known before well the book goes into that in great detail because uh america was very uniquely founded uh it was founded at the local level uh as a mirror to the athenian democracy wherein everybody of a locality is represented by themselves where everyone has a vote Everyone can speak to any issue, and it is uh, modeled in America, you'll find, on the uh, uh, towns of New England, where they each have a town square, where all are welcome to the town square, whether they're a fisherman or a carpenter, 
or a journalist or a publisher. Everyone goes to the town square to express their views and have a direct vote on things directly affecting them. At the next level, at the state level, uh, we are governed on the Roman model of a republic where persons vote for their representatives to go to state assemblies and there exercise their representative powers of the people deriving from the people. At the federal level, uh, we patterned ourselves on the Iroquois uh, Confederation. Not many people know that, but it was a new concept, the federal concept, when the colonists came to America. And the Iroquois idea of federalism was that all the tribes are representative, represented, and all the persons of the tribes are represented in a federal body that uh, maintains the powers of the individual and the rights of the individual at the maximum, above that of the tribe or the federation. That was their key component. Uh, and so, and, and further on than that, in our Constitution, the element of the Magna Carta and the idea of individual rights and e equality before the law comes into mode. So of all those four elements that were uniquely represented in America, we derived our Constitution uniquely uh, and away from, apart from that of other constitutions, such as the uh, British Constitution. Yeah, I understand that there are a lot, you know, we say democracies all around the world now, but it seems like democracies like they have in Britain and other countries, it's, it's different. It's a parliamentary system. And how is, you know, how is that different from what we know here? I think it tends to at the federal level, uh, and only at the federal level, um, their democracies are more proportional, whereas we are more oppositional. So you have two parties in America that are dominant, whereas if you go to uh, Italy, which again, you're correct, Michael, it's parliamentarian, um, the parties have proportional power, so the parties are always vying for power uh so they aren't you know represented by 10 percent but by 20 percent they're angling for that in our in our uh democracy the choices are more stark between two parties as opposed to many parties and do you think there's a weakness in what they have or a weakness in what we have in terms of uh, the party system strength, i think it's a strength to to have two parties that are each strong enough to stand on their own and uh, make their own arguments. And, and why do you think that's better than uh, what they have over there? Well, I think if you're a party in Italy and you, you have 20% of the power in, in the federal government, I think you're, you're, you always have the same constituency and they buy into what you're selling, but you never can exercise your ideas fully. So what it does is keep politicians in perpetual power within that party rather than, you know, voicing your ideas fully, putting them into practice and seeing if they work. Interesting. That actually makes a lot of sense. So, um, <laughs> <Hope so. laughs> in, in speaking, in speaking about uh, democracy here, I've noticed a lot in conservative circles that they're really against using the word democracy or calling America a democracy. They much prefer the term republic. Do you think there is sort of a distinction between those two terms, and do you think America is more of a republic? And, you know, it seems like the reason why they're afraid to call it a democracy is they're afraid of mob rule and majoritarian rule, where the majority gets whatever they want. Right. Well, that's, that's exactly why we're formed the way we were formed. At the local level, again, at the town and city level, um, we're supposed to be ruled by a democratic process which means if you are in a town of 10,000 people and convene a, a town meeting, every one of those 10,000 people can be there. Now, when you have an, uh, an idea in the town that is, you know, uh, evolves some passion, people are either passionately, passionately for it or passionately against it, you can foresee, well, people are going to get into some scuffs. When you go to a representative government, uh, there's, there's more of a extension of that where persons can reasonably discuss ideas without being in a in a mob of 10,000 people. Now, and I think the other reason is, too, and you talked about this earlier, is the American Constitution was not only founded 
on democratic principles, but also based on the Magna Carta, where you have individual rights. And I and I'm guessing you support the idea that even in democratic rule, those the majority doesn't necessarily have the ability to take away your individual rights. No, that is that is the third element, uh, absolutely essential element of our constitution that it both defines what powers the individual has, it confines the powers that rule the individual, and it guarantees the rights of every individual and also guarantees equality before the law. In other words, not a single person is treated differently than any other person. And that and and all these things derive from the different parts of, of the history of democracy. Uh, the direct idea of uh, the power of a locality and each person having equal power in a locality is from the uh, Athenians. Representative government comes from the Romans, and our idea of individual rights and equality before the law comes in the rebellion against King John and the Magna Carta. So all those things were interwoven, and the, and the other add-on in our federal system was the idea of a confederation of states. So you go from individual, uh, individual uh, powers in a locality to representative in, in, in a state to federal, uh, at the federal level, uh, but everyone, each individual, has rights under law, protections under law, and equality before the law. And that's the beauty of the system. And what do you think are some misconceptions about democratic societies in the democratic process? I think, I think you can call any society a democracy. Uh, Stalin, when he came into power in Russia, was said to have created the most democratic constitution that ever existed. However, it was never enforced. So just because you, the democracy was never enforced uh, by the state... So uh, you can call anything a democracy, right? You can call anything a yeah. republic. The key, the key is how it functions, right? I can call myself blue, but it doesn't make me blue. Oh, yeah, that totally makes sense because I, it seems like in communist countries, in fascist countries of the past, they would add the term republic or democracy or democratic in the name of their country but as you said that doesn't mean it didn't really mean anything in process right exactly it's it's in the manner in which it functions are all rights equally protected uh you know fundamentally do persons exercise uh any power or is it all derived from from the above from from a city or a state I'm speaking with Richard Lyons. He is uh, the author of the new book, The DNA of Democracy. We've been discussing this very important topic, not only in the history of democracy, but how American democracy is different from other democracies in the world and how American democracy was uniquely founded on fundamental, fundamental principles from democracies of our past put together to make a very unique system. If you want more information on this book, well, you can find the book, The DNA of Democracy, wherever books are available. And I'm speaking with the author of the new book, The DNA of Democracy, Richard Lyons, who is still on the phone with me right now. And Richard, in the past couple of segments, we were we were discussing the history of democracy and how American democracy is unique and it was able to borrow principles from the democracies of the past and put it together into a very good and unique system. But next I wanted to discuss, because I have a feeling you wrote this book because you feel like democracy in America might be under threat. Why, why do you feel that way? Um, and you're right, Michael. I wrote the first, this is volume one of a three-volume series. And I wrote this first volume to show where uh, our democracy came from specifically, what its underpinnings are, and therefore, therefore to define what creates a good democracy. I do think it's under threat somewhat, uh, and that uh, the cause of that is that I've noticed, as many people have, that over the last 50 years, uh, powers have been taken from uh, the assemblies, uh, town assemblies of uh, New England, unto the federal government. They've been taken from state governments under the federal government uh, and away 
within the federal government from the legislature, which is our foremost representation in the federal government, and put in the executive branch of government in the housings of agencies. Um, and so I've, I've, we were just talking about it a moment ago during the break, but I don't know anybody in any federal agency. So when you want to talk about, uh, again, the let's use the EPA as an example, I don't know anybody who represents me in the EPA. And I never voted for them, and I can't call them if I want to. Uh, I just I don't know who they are. So now you have the concentration of power away from localities and states in the federal system. Within the federal system, it's shifted away from legislature to agencies. And the agencies are, are most influenced by, guess whom? Lobbyists, none of whom represent me <laughs> or you or any other citizen, so to speak. So um, that worries me. And so I'll go into detail uh, of that in, in Volume 2, which will be called Shadows of the Acropolis, and will be out in one year. How did we get here as a country? I mean, you mentioned well, that. I think it's, a, I, I think it's a, a dynamic of power. All power where it exists concentrates itself unless people pay attention and don't allow it to happen. Um, and you can, tell, you can tell how the government in, in Washington has grown by how much it eats how much it wastes and the reach of its power. And it's, it's like a natural living organism. Any organism wants to grow. Any living organism wants to strengthen. And its next tendency is to protect itself. And its next tendency is to create a predatory area that it can call its own. Uh, and I think that process happens in any government. It seems like, though, we're giving up this power willingly that if you... If any politician mentions that they want to uh, bring back the power to Congress or they want to uh, put more controls on these bureaucratic agencies or maybe even get rid of some of the bureaucracy, that they're kind of labeled as a bad person who doesn't care about X or Y issue. And it seems like the American people are just willingly giving up this power. Do you see that as well? Uh, yes, I do. I, I think it has a couple of um, causes. I think first, uh, the the growth of government is built on causes. We have to help this. We have to help that. Most of most of it has come at the expense of what used to be spiritual, charitable agencies. Uh, previous to 50 years ago, if someone had a problem within, let's say, Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, somebody had a personal problem and and uh, was given to addiction, let's say. It would be the locality, the people in the locality who would say, hey, look, it seems you have a problem uh, with addiction and, and holding a job and so forth, and it would be the church or fellow families or his community that would help him. Now it's the federal government who has to help every single person with every single problem in the country. And so if ever you try and say of the government, hey, you know, you should really reduce yourself in size, first of all, no power will ever willingly gave up power. And secondly, uh, you know, uh, it comes out uh, that you're a very uh, mean, evil person because you don't want the government to help absolutely everybody. Um, so I think we're in that dilemma. What, what We've would gone you... away from people helping yeah. themselves or communities helping themselves to the federal government being a universal overlord. What would you say to that person, though, that responds and says, yeah, we've willingly given up some of this power, but it makes for a better society. The government's good and should do all of these things to help society be better. What would you say to that person? I think it tends to an overreaching power of government and, uh, and a weakening of the general populace. It's not, uh, and, and this is the whole point of the book, it's not how America was founded. America became what it was because everybody... Uh, exercise their own strengths. And then if they had a fellow in their locality uh, that needed help, they were helped at the community level, not at the federal level. I think it's a better help. I think federal government and federal agencies are fed uh, by weakness. The more people that they have on their roles, uh, the stronger they are. The bigger their budgets, the more their importance. I think we were founded in, a, in the reverse manner. Uh, the persons helping themselves create a better uh, collective strength. 
How do we reverse course? How do we get back to our founding principles? I think by uh, reversing the power vacuum from the federal government and restoring power to localities. Individuals first, localities second, associations, spiritual associations third, uh, and state governments. Just and and it it wouldn't be a great uh, a great hardship. You would find that when power absents itself, uh, the natural powers of society take over. And that I go into great uh, length in the book about that, and it is how America was founded. Of a sudden, colonists in America didn't have an overlord anymore. Not there was no aristocratic overlord, no monarch, and so the societal powers that are natural to society emerged and those were those of the individual uh those of individual enterprises and occupations those of spiritual and educational associations and none of which had to do with the government and i'm guessing that the other part of the process is education which is why you want people to read your book exactly (laughs) and uh exactly and so the book is the dna of democracy uh, the author here, Richard Lyons, uh, uh, you can find the book uh, anywhere uh, books are available, Amazon, your local bookstore. Richard, it's been a great conversation. I hope people will check out your book. Uh, I've definitely enjoyed this. And when you uh, finish the second volume, we'll bring you back on, okay? Oh, that sounds great, Michael. And I thank you for your time today.